Paul? Can you hear me? So first, first I'm supposed to follow a spy and then Chomsky? <laughs> <laughs> we can't see you. Is your webcam on? Oh. Perfect. Um, just a second. Uh, if anybody has questions up there, I can't see you. So I would suggest all the people that are up there uh, who have questions just come down so I have a better vision of uh, who to uh, point out to when somebody has a question. Um, let's keep it like this, that we stay 10 to 15 minutes. Everybody who has a question, just raise their hand and I'll point to you. Keep your questions as short as possible. And uh, yeah, let's begin. Everybody, I'm kind of confused about this whole thing of keeping a low profile and not uh, letting the NSA keep our names for nasty use later when things get tougher. And, um, you know, I mean, that seems so contradictory to me. And I mean, Facebook and the social media are such a good method of, uh, you know, sharing information and also asking people to participate in worthy causes. And so uh, it seems kind of contradictory to me. Mm. For who is that question? The question is, uh, <laughs> what do we really do then? <laughs> you know, we don't want to be intimidated, but we don't want to be giving ammunition to some nasty people who are going to use it in nasty ways later. And so if we don't use the social media, what do we use? Okay. And, you know, like Skype, I mean, how do we encrypt Skype? I mean, I, uh, the whole thing seems... For who is the question I, I was asking you? For who? Uh, uh, for well, Paul I, the, or Annie? Uh, a word from each would be nice. All right. <laughs> Well, it's a big question. I could speak for about an hour on this one. <laughs> um, things like Facebook and uh, other social media are the spy's wet dream. Um, in the 1990s, in the analog era, we used to have to spend weeks gathering the sort of information, personal information, that we now offer up for free on Facebook. And I suppose in the early days you could say, well, Facebook is just fun and you meet up with old friends. But now, post-Snowden, we know very much um, the complicity between the corporations and the uh, military surveillance complex, and the NSA, GCHQ particularly. So um, I think this, this is core cool because at the moment we have a situation where the internet is becoming the uh, neural network, I suppose, of the modern world. Not just the social media for, for we citizens, but also it runs our countries, it runs our banking systems, it runs our health systems, all our records, it runs transport, it runs um, you know, basic infrastructure. So it's all interconnected, and if it's all open to attack, from the spy agencies of whatever country, then we are all vulnerable. And I think this is one of the big themes. Noam Chomsky mentioned um, what are the big threats this century. One of them is the fact that the uh, neural network of our modern world is completely vulnerable to takeover, not just by uh, sort of cyber hackers or cyber warfare people coming out of China, Russia, wherever we want to say, but by the NSA too. And I think this is a major problem for um, our very way of life. And to go to pull back to Facebook, yes, it's convenient, but I would suggest if you're going to use it, I mean, I have a profile on Facebook. I don't do anything with it apart from put tweets on it. I use Twitter, my bad. Um, but, <laughs> but to use it mindfully, it doesn't matter what privacy settings you put on Facebook. Facebook knows everything that you put on Facebook. It is an open book for them, and they are an open book for the spies. So this is a merger of the sort of major corporations and the major state infrastructure. And to finish, the, the basic quote I would always go back to is the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini's definition of fascism, which was the merger of the corporate and the state. And that is precisely what we're seeing now. So I'm not trying to frighten everyone or scare everyone off social media, but just be mindful of how they use it and mindful of what we give away. Paul, do you have any comments on that? <laughs> I mean, what are they going to do with all this information? You talk to people like William Binney and some of the other guys from the NSA, they think these people are so drowning in information, they don't know what the hell to do with it all. In fact, you know, Binney and some of the other NSA guys, they had designed a way to actually mm. gather intelligence in a way that was kind of meaningful, because you would only go so many levels away from an actual target that had some at least some level of verifiable information 
Um, they've turned this into such a needle in a haystack that it's almost impossible for them to grapple with it all. So, you know, uh, again, I don't want to underestimate our concern about this, and I certainly share Annie and others' concerns about it, but let's not also, they don't control the world. You know, they've tried to. They would love to control the world, but it's constantly spinning out of their control. And, uh, and so, and, I mean, how many people are on Facebook saying political things? Millions. Millions of people. What are they going to do with all of that? Now, if, I mean, if you were really involved in some very serious organizing and you really needed to keep some tactic or strategy unknown to the agencies, okay, get offline. I mean, that's kind of obvious. But, uh, but we shouldn't all walk around so paranoid that we're not going to step forward and take a stand and be engaged and be active because we're worried. I mean, the truth is they've been, listen, the Canadian security establishment has a, uh, there's a Canadian law where the Canadian security establishment cannot spy on Canadians. The Australian security <laughs> establishment has a law they cannot spy on Australians. So what did they do for decades? The Canadians spied on the Australians and then gave them the information, and the Australians did the same thing for the Canadians. And, of course, the NSA was doing the same thing. It's been going on for a long time. It, is it unacceptable? Yes. Is it civilized? No. Is it anything in common with democracy? No. And we should raise our voices against it. But we don't need to walk around being afraid of it because what the hell are they going to do with all this information? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a key point here, Paul, that the legal parameters can change. And in this of all countries, we know that the laws can change very rapidly. So what we are doing now, waving a placard on the street, which is legal, we are exercising our citizens' rights to do it, our free speech rights, tomorrow could be deemed to be a crime. Now, what we have at the moment is this vast technological capability that our governments and spies have never had before to store all this information and use it potentially retrospectively, which is where the self-censorship issue might come in. But there are, there are simple ways to take steps to protect your own privacy. We don't have to rely on our governments. We don't have to hope that Facebook won't sell us out, because they do, because that's their business model as well as their spy model. You know, just go along to crypto parties. This is a global phenomenon that's taken off over the last two years, where you take your computer along and socially minded technologists will help you encrypt stuff. And, you know, even Edward Snowden has said that PGP, pretty good privacy protection, can, can uh, keep your privacy under control. One other point I just do want to make, and this is one of the lesser known uh, disclosures that came out of the Snowden cash, was that the spies have a way of manipulating uh, public polls, opinion polls, where they can go in under the hood and change the results. Now think about this. All Ch changing our, YouTube numbers too. Yeah, so all our governments now we know in the West are obsessed with focus groups and opinion polls. This is how they base their policies in order to get re-elected because being re-elected is their job. Not about governing or looking after their countries, our countries. It's getting re-elected to keep their snouts in a trough for another five years. So if you've got agencies that can go in and change the opinion polls, they can subvert the very foundations that our governments will use to create new policies and subvert our democratic wishes. Yeah, now, that is really frightening, I think. It's really I wonder one of the tactics that the it's, Panthers it's, used. One second, this is really frightening because um, on our Facebook page on uh, Activism Munich, this event, actually, I really looked deep into it because 300 people shared it and there was like 800 likes. And if you, if I'm looking at the statistics, it says 10 likes. I was like, what's going on? And maybe this is some sort of fault, but maybe I'm not trying to be paranoid because Paul is advising not to be paranoid and you're advising me to protect yourself. <laughs> so just to wrap up what you both are saying, uh, protect yourself yeah. and don't get paranoid. Yeah. That gentleman there was before you and then you're next. Uh, please, uh, that gentleman there, uh, please do um, mention who you're addressing uh, the question to. Yeah. Um, let me say first that I'm delighted to have a discussion by your organizers which uh, link us to progressive people in the United States. This is something which is missing quite a lot in Europe. We are missing it uh, in a way. Uh, we, we can't go on like this. So this is a first step, very important. I was very much interested to listen to what Paul said about Baltimore. 
Uh, however, I think here in Munich, the conditions are quite a bit different. And I would like to address this question to our friend from Britain. Um, I, I would like, I think I can assume that the majority in this audience is reading one of the two main newspapers in Munich. That's either Süddeutsche Zeitung or Münchner Merkur. But I really have doubts, uh, if you see the majority of citizens in Munich, may this, maybe this is an exceptional audience, but the majority of citizens in Munich think that these are reliable papers. And I think in Europe we have to do something mm. to undermine this perception. We have to confront them in many ways with lies and mistakes they are doing. I, I remind you on something which was uh, contained in a, in a special booklet from Süddeutsche Zeitung about, about the last year, the events in uh, 2014. And if you read the article on TTIP, on the free trade, the so-called free trade agreement, we should never talk about free trade, uh, on the trade agreement, you find an article still now in Süddeutsche Zeitung, which praises this agreement. You see, uh, sometimes we, we uh, try to applaud to, to uh, a person like Harry Bert Prantl, who writes uh, very progressive commentaries, who says TTIP is a perversion of legal thinking, a perversion. And now, if you read these booklets, a summary of the whole year, the correspondent in, in New York, Nicholas Pieper, raises this agreement. I think we have to tackle this. Mm. That's a very good question. And I think it goes back to what Paul and I are sort of grappling with. Transparency needs to be imposed on governments. It needs to be imposed on the laws that we are allowed to see made in our name. It should not automatically be imposed on we the citizens, because we can't be good citizens if we don't have privacy. Um, but no, in terms of the media, I have been saying, I've been through the mill myself. When you go public and become a whistleblower, you are a media virgin, you don't know how it works. And you have to learn very fast and very hard how difficult the process is and how different media outlets will manipulate your story for their own ends, political ends. And also how the governments and the spies and corporations can spin the mainstream media through connections with the, the bosses, the owners, the editors, the journalists. So it's a very murky world to go into. So all I can say in response to that is don't rely on one news outlet. You know, watch the real news network. <laughs> watch the real news, watch activism, watch as many outlets as you can and read in, in your own country, there will be one newspaper that's traditionally one position and one that's very opposite. Read both of them and take note of how they choose to cover the same stories. And more importantly, take note of how they choose not to cover certain stories the other feels is important. And that is a very good way of trying to piece it together. Now, of course, we all live busy lives. We don't have time to obsess about the news. But just do this you know, as an experiment, perhaps, for a week. And you will see some startling anomalies in the whole process. And it can get you thinking about how stories are covered. And one of the most interesting ones going on at the moment is the crisis in Ukraine. I mean, this is glaring. You know, within, what, half an hour of uh, the Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 coming down, it must have been Putin. The whole of the Western media. Why can we not wait for a proper investigation with facts? I mean, my former partner, David Shaler, was in charge of um, an investigation into the Lockerbie uh, shoot down. Not the actual thing in 1998, but having to rebut this spin coming out of Libya saying it was not uh, responsible in 1994. And that whole investigation took years. It took multinational cooperation across many different countries and many different law enforcement agencies and many different intelligence agencies. And even now, there is uncertainty about exactly what happened. So how could our Western media immediately say, Putin? 
MH17. So, you know, have a delve around, look at different sources, and I really admire independent alternative news sources that are coming out. The Real News Network has done beautiful work over so many years now, and I think activism as well will become a, a force for good, a sort of core that will coalesce activism here. And bro more broadly. Um, I just uh, make a brief comment. Uh, when I started, uh, I didn't study journalism. I just had certain moral principles that led me to do what I do today. But uh, to touch on our point, I watch Al Jazeera and I saw how they serve state interest, and I watched RT, and I watched all of them um, the night before I went to sleep, and I watched CNN, and I watched all mainstream news, and I saw how each country does really good reporting on their critic, on, yeah. on, the, on their on the countries that don't. Uh, align the same interests. Like Russia is really good at criticizing the United States, and the United States is really good at criticizing Russia, and Al Jazeera is sort of aligned with the United States because they have in a lot of interest in Qatar and all that. And this is where I was really fed up. And then I saw people, experts that were on the show, and then I typed their name, and I came on the Real News Network, and that was a change for me. And I came on Democracy Now!, and that was sort of the, you could say, the roots to activism that I came and stumbled upon these people. So I, I would also um, supplement your point by saying, watch everything and make up your own opinion because I believe in human intelligence and I think people can see when they're being lied to in their face. So, um, yeah. One second, that gentleman there was for the next question. And then you. You just mentioned uh, we can't be good citizens um, if we are uh, if we don't have privacy. Um, I would go a step further though, if we're if we're talking about the very foundations of democracy, and I tend to say we do not have such thing like democracy unless there is complete transparency of public action. Uh, and we don't have transparency of public action. That would be exactly the requirement we all need in order to, to vote, like in our own interest, and also for, uh, for journalism to have the right information. And the question would be to both of you basically, what can we do to, to, uh, to really get transparency of and, and not relying on whistleblowers, really get transparency of public action. Let's start with Paul. I, I didn't quite, what can we do to get something published? I didn't quite get the last few words. What, what can we do to attain real transparency um, uh, of our officials and all what's happening behind our backs? What can uh, probably a citizen, the alternative media and everybody uh, as a collective do to uh, implement transparency in our society? Well, I guess there's two big things. One is we have to, we have to build a mass audience for independent media. We can't just be talking to a small group of very progressive people. If we don't have a mass audience, we'll have, we won't have the power that media could have to try to create some level of accountability over the existing politicians and the existing elites. Um, but more profoundly, if you really want transparency and you really want to deal with this, then there needs to be, you know, a different class needs to govern. You can't have a tiny handful of people. I mean, what is it? 1%, I think it is, of the, na of the world has, what was the figure? 40% of the wealth? Yeah, and they're is. not going to be transparent about that. Now, I mean, the whole way Wall Street works is to be as a obtuse as possible, like derivative, the whole, the, the, the size of the derivatives plays in the global economy right now, if you take into account leveraging, the amount of money involved in derivatives is six times global GDP. You can't be transparent about that because it's all about smoke and mirrors. But why do we have an economy that's so parasitical? Because so much wealth has gone to so few hands. So we can start with saying these things in the media, which are just bloody self-apparent, but mainstream media covers it all up. So we can start with trying to reveal, you know, how this system works, mm -hmm. who it benefits. But most importantly, we need to do news for people who really want change and will act. So we need to change who has power. 
Mm-hmm. And I think it starts at the level of certain cities. But we've got to get serious about this. We don't have a big window for doing this. And you know, maybe it's a 10, 15 year window. Maybe it's less. Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of economic crisis, climate change crisis, you know, the pot, you know, this system normally goes to war when it doesn't know what else to do. And that's, you know, often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're going so, in very dangerous times. So basically, support news. Uh, can you make a brief answer, and then we'll do a last question on that gentleman there. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I'm just painfully briefly. aware of that. I have very, th- I have three very brief points. One is um, we should get into a position where we don't need whistleblowers, so that there are proper channels they can go to before they have to go public and ruin their lives. Um, where their claims are listened to and investigated and those who have committed wrong are held accountable. That would be one step. That would be great. Secondly, a flatter society. Look at Norway after the Andreas Breivik uh, terrorist attacks. Did they turn their lives inside out and clamp down and create a police state? No, they didn't. They have a very transparent society where everyone's records are out there in public. People can see what's going on. It's very open. And they said, we are not capitulating to this terrorist threat. We will continue our way of life. And they have and it's been wonderful. And thirdly, the third, third point I want to make, and this is very crucial, this is something I uh, worked with with uh, Senator Mike Gravel, who worked with Daniel Ellsberg to get the Pentagon Papers read into the public record about the Vietnam War. Mike Gravel has been campaigning ever since for something he calls direct democracy. Get away with this representative democracy. We vote for people to represent us, and they end up being paid, bought and paid for and representing corporate or whatever interests. We need to get to direct democracy. If this sounds like some nebulous utopia, it's not. It's almost there in Switzerland. They have cantons. They have direct national public referenda on key issues that affect their country. And despite the very conservative view of Switzerland, every time something controversial comes up, they tend to actually go down the more controversial path as human beings because they feel they have a say and they have a humanity around that process. So perhaps all of our countries should start looking at this possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, let's turn to the last question, uh, at that person. Okay, we'll, we'll do two questions. That's, that's about it, all right? <laughs> uh, Annie and Paul, you both uh, chose ways of working outside of the system as a whistleblower or as an independent journalist, respectively. And you did this because of uh, manipulation, uh, control uh, inherent in our system. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for example, in Germany, we, we think that we are living in a democracy, social democracy even, with elections and the government has the answer to the people, etc., etc. So my question is the following for, for both of you, if you like. Uh, do you see any chance of um, fighting the surveillance state from within the political system? Do you, do you see any likelihood or possibility of a political solution from within the system and how can we increase the likelihood of this happening? Thank you. I think very briefly in Germany there was a likelihood that the political class, certain bits of the political class would try and um, reform not reform what was going on with the spy agencies. Uh, there was so much anger, anger about Angela Merkel's telephone being bugged and 80 million Germans being bugged and um, the BND, you know, collaborating so closely with the NSA. However, that seems to have been subsumed with the sort of uh, response that, oh, we've got to work now with the US because of potential people returning from ISIS and creating havoc in the country. It's all media manipulation. There is a chance Um, And I think because you have a um, a collaborative democracy in terms of different parties having to work together rather than a first-past-the-post democracy like we have in the US and the UK, there is a greater chance. So go out and lobby and pressure, you know, smaller political groups. One of the things that gave me great hope a few years ago was the sudden surge in popularity of the Pirate Party. It made great gains in Nordrhein-Westphalia. And... It's not just about, you know, intellectual property rights. A lot of their, their um, basic policies are very, very progressive. And it's a shame that they've not really quite pushed through the barrier. But those sort of parties need support. Um, and we can hopefully build on that. I mean, that was a very grassroots thing. It came from the bottom up and said, we don't like the established parties. We want something different. And it's also slightly generational. So... Well, do you believe uh, that the uh, political system um, is capable of dealing with uh, this issue of privacy and, and causing transparency? 
I don't kind of use the word in or out of the system because we're all in the system. Um, if you want to talk conventional political parties versus not or conventional media versus not, I mean, we're not, we're not doing, like out of the system, I think would be you're doing illegal things and robbing banks or something. And even that is kind of within the spirit of the system anyway. Uh, <laughs> the banks are robbing us, don't forget. <laughs> yeah. uh, banks are robbing the banks. But, but I, I think the... Is, is, are the current, are the elites who are governing and the pol politicians and the political military intelligence strata that represents and defends the system, are they capable of creating some reforms in terms of the security state? And I think the, the, I think the main answer is no, but maybe in very small ways if they turn it on each other. There was a lot of resentment the way Hoover blackmailed people with the intelligence. You know, Hoover, former head of the FBI, he blackmailed all kinds of people. Uh, in fact, when I was saying about the guy who was police chief at the LAPD, he wound up blackmailing the elite of Hollywood in LA. Yeah, like, like, you know, I, it was interesting. Uh, when Petraeus' computer was broken into, then there were some squawks. Oh, wh who gave permission to go into Petraeus' computer and find out he was having such and such affair and all this? So, you know, maybe there's certain things if they turn on each other. But I think we're at a stage now. I, I interviewed Ralph Nader a few months ago, and I asked him, do you think the kind of reforms that you were able to win back in the 60s, could you do it now? And he says, absolutely not. He says, the system's beyond these kinds of reforms now. The stuff that you might have been able to do 30, 40 years ago. So, so it's, it's maybe, I mean, I think whistleblowers play a tremendous role. They're very courageous. And maybe through the efforts of whistleblowers, it will, it will alarm sections of the elites who are not in on all this security stuff, and they don't want to get spied on themselves. It's not, you know, it's possible. But that isn't really where it's going to come mm -hmm. from. We have to change who has power. Mm -hmm. And then you can start taking on some of these issues because the, the system is very resilient. It can assimilate. Like what happened after Manning's revelations? Did anything change? What happened after Snowden's revelations? Did anything change? The system can assimilate a lot of this stuff because there's tremendous inertia and there is a good 20% in the United States and it's probably true in most countries of people who are doing very well. Thank you very much. And they don't, they're, they're okay sacrificing their privacy if it means keeping their wealth. Mm -hmm. So we need to arouse, as I've been saying all night, ordinary people. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and through their fight for their interests, these issues can start to get addressed. Can I totally agree? We do need to do that. We need to activate the whole, whole of society. One thing that does give me hope, though, is um, looking at the vested interests, looking at the intelligence agencies, they are now calling potential whistleblowers insider threats. There are whole papers written to um, try and identify certain behaviours that might lead to whistleblowing and things like that. So actually, they're beginning to eat themselves from within. It's like a, a worm in, in the apple. And I think this gives me hope that it's not sustainable. Let, we'll see where it goes. I'll bring it to full circle. Um, you need whistleblowers for for consciousness on issues such as transparency, which then activates people to go on the streets, the ordinary people, which can then take over and reform the system. So let's get to the last uh, question of the evening. Thank you. So uh, speaking here so much about manipulations, um, a phrase came up into my mind, and it's... Uh, Excuse me, can you speak louder? Can yeah, yeah, of course. So, speaking about all the time and hearing, of course, about manipulations, a phrase came into my mind, and I cannot really uh, remember who the author was, but it was something like, um, the best way to avoid manipulation is by knowing how it works. Mm -hmm. And why I'm asking this? Because I'm a psychology and uh, public relations student, and I was thinking to myself, isn't it better to... Uh, make uh, some kind of seminar or teach the people how uh, to expose the media, that their strategies, their, the, way, the way they are, they are 
uh, changing our minds because uh, and our opinions, of course. Because if you think about that, um, what is politics? Politics is um, just a representation of the media, and media is also politics. I mean, the, this uh, you cannot uh, make the the difference these days about these uh, two things. Paul, what do you what, what would you say actually about that? Uh, for who do you uh, want a question? Uh, about Paul. For me? Yeah. Paul. Okay. For Paul. For Paul. Paul. For Paul. You, you too. Okay. Paul? What do you, and I, uh, I'll explain you the question if you didn't hear it properly. I tell Paul. it again. What what would, no, no, we, we got it. We got it. I'll, I'll, I'll pose the okay. question again to Paul. Thanks. Paul is asking why uh, uh, the, the media manipulates us and, and the politicians manipulate us. So why doesn't manipulation become a study of itself that people like you and I in the alternative media take up and provide some analysis on manipulation so we can understand better that we are getting uh, lied to or manipulated. Sorry. Uh, let, let me repeat. <laughs> Why isn't the art of manipulation uh, an issue that people like you and I take up, like provide media analysis or to, how they manipulate us? We are talking about issues after issues, but we don't talk about the art that these people uh, employ to manipulate us. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think we need to do more of it. Uh, one of the things we're... I have this show I do on the Real, New, Real News called Reality Asserts Itself. And I usually start by trying to get the story of the interview subject, how their own identity was created. And especially people that grew up during the uh, Cold War years, how much the Cold War mentality permeated people's identity. And then they start to unpack it because their own life experience starts to contradict the mythology. Um, we need to do a better job of unpacking the mass media and how it keeps reinforcing people's identity based on lies, based on deceptions. I mean, how, how many Amer poor Americans walk around thinking USA, USA? I mean, it's unbelievable. People, people go die for this. You know, you talk to soldiers and people that volunteer, they, they really, it's so part of who they are, what their identity is, it's such a false identity. So I think it's a good question. It's a challenge that we need to do better at, of how to not just like cover news stories, but try to unpack that whole identity that allows the official narrative to be so blindly accepted. I'll make a brief comment. First of all, watch reality or set itself. It's a show that has a lot to tell about history, about personality, and so forth. Secondly, uh, Activism Munich is working on a project this, this month. We're also going to release a show in which we provide media analysis. We have an expert. I won't uh, give away the name right now because I want to keep people excited who's going to basically just look at articles and show us the exploitative methods, the psychological methods, emotional um, uh, exploitation of people. So keep, keep uh, tuned and uh, you'll find out more about what you asked. So, um, yeah. Can I? Question? Okay. okay. That's uh, unfair because that woman asked first. It's, it's, it's going to be a quick one. Um, um, one second, then we'll just do this. And okay. Really brief, give the uh, woman in the front first the mic and then we'll do, but really brief, this has to end. We really have to end now. <laughs> Who? Uh, there was a woman um, she, right there. Much. Just really Thank you. brief. Yeah, this is brief. This was a question towards Amy yeah, and related to the, your statement early on when you said we should support whistleblowers more. We should be more rewarding towards them. And I can, I kind of feel really helpless with that because I have no idea how to do that. I mean, I can sign petition and I can write a birthday letter to Chelsea Manning and so on. Yeah, which is fine, or maybe a sign, or maybe just something, you know, but I feel really like I, I don't know what to do to be supportive and to, you know, penalize the bad guys, help the good guys. I don't yeah. know what to do. Well, thank you for your concern and, and interest in trying to do this. Uh, what I've noticed over the last few years working with so many different whistleblower organizations is that there are many... Um, starting up nationally um, uh, in the UK, there's something called the Whistler that offers free legal advice, free psychological support, and just a network where they can talk to each other and survive the process from all different sectors, you know, health, banking, arms, whatever. Um, and there's one in Germany called Networks, I believe, as well. So just making, you know, having a search, finding out what is in your country, giving them a little bit of money, perhaps, so that they can 
um, organize events, socials for the whistleblowers, um, or perhaps if you know someone who could offer free psychological counseling or someone who could organize a free helpline where someone thinking about doing it could ring up and say, how do I? I mean, um, I think it's, it's invaluable. The whistleblowing itself is a very strange process. It's very exciting and you feel very energized when you're building up to doing it. When you're caught up in the story, everyone wants a piece of you and asset strips you for the information. And afterwards, you're left with nothing. Yeah, what do you do? You have no job, no reputation, potentially in prison, no income. That's the bit where people need support, particularly. Um, and it's just following these cases and getting involved in networks. And at, not, you know, it doesn't always have to be an Edward Snowden level. It can be <coughs> local town government. It can be health. It can be banking. It can be whatever. But just to make this concept normalised, because I do think that. Failing adequate transparency and failing a really effective media that should do its job and hold power to account, whistleblowers from whichever sector will be the regulators of last resort for all of us. And we, we really need to honour everyone who comes out of whatever sector and turns their life, life upside down to do what they do. Um, so, thank you for your question. Right. Last question, please. Okay, thank you. Um... So the question goes to Paul and activism. My question would be, um, when you look at corporates, they measure their success in margins, in uh, profitability, etc. So you heard Noam Chomsky denounce the, the, the principle of short-term profit maximization orientation. So now, um, if you look at the two, or if you look at uh, your two organizations, how do you measure your success? Um, Paul, you want to start, or should I? Sure. How do we measure our success? Is that the question? Yep, yes, that's the question. He just uh, t t uh, talked about profit maximization and how corporations measure their success with that. So in comparison to that, how do you measure your success given that that orientation of profit maximization falls out? Uh, well, partly how many donations we get. <laughs> uh, we need money to do what we do. Uh, if we were just doing what we were doing before Baltimore, I don't know that we would have considered it very successful and whether we would have kept doing it. Uh, even if we had a very, even if our audience was 50, 100,000 average per hour, you know, rivaled KB, cable TV and all of this, I don't know that would be a success. Um, this is where we go to this, the reason for coming to Baltimore. We'll measure our success if I hope by 2020, we can help create, we can win the local news market. And by doing that, help inspire a movement with candidates that takes over the city and the state. That will be success. So in the short term, you could say, I mean, not speaking as the real news, speaking just individually. Uh, like somewhere, the coin dropped for me when I was fairly young. If I don't do the most meaningful thing I can do, I ain't very happy. So I got to do whatever that is. And right now, I don't know anything more meaningful I could be doing than this. But just to sort of say what I said before, we have a very short window before we're in very, very difficult times. I mean, it's already very difficult times for many people, but for those of us in the industrialized world, you know, that have a very privileged bubble we're in, we do now have a, a space to organize in. And we will really regret it 10, 15 years from now if we haven't taken full advantage of the space that we have because we can lose it. So if we don't have a, you know a media that can speak to you know tens and thousands of people and people don't get organized to assert their interests then we could see you know, you know we could repeat some of the stuff we saw in the 20th century um 
let me just finish this up by saying I don't I have a problem with the word success to be honest it's it's uh, career success and all this is a system which I don't allude to I I, I find success uh, or let's put it this way I find happiness with when I see people right here, and we raise consciousness, when when activism Munich brings people together, it's it's for us happiness when we are 30 people not making a cent out of what we're doing, and we come together as a collective organization. Uh, be it the person who's guiding you when you come in, be it the person who's at the ticket counter, be it the person, the camera people. All of these people that are part of this organization gives me this collective feeling of being one unit, and I, I'm sure that's how it works in the Real News Network, and I'm sure that's how it works in Leap, where uh, Annie is really active. It's just a collective feeling that you have, and, and, and that's what Chomsky says, this is the biggest thing that they're afraid of, that people organize, collect, find a certain philosophy, and they want to destroy this at its grassroots, early stage level. So for me, First of all, when I hear about the NSA, that's for me success, because they're scared of us. That's why they have the surveillance state. When I hear about uh, uh, people like um, having to flee and all, I mean, that's bad stories, but it shows me something. These guys are so scared that they have to run around somebody that's 29 years old, you know? Like, what's wrong with these people? And so for me, uh, success is not the right word. I'll say happiness is more of the word that I'm, I'm going to allude to here. And, I, I do I, I'm not, I understand Paul, but I don't have a vision of how it should be in 20 years. I just do what I can at this moment with the team that is standing behind this cause and just keep on doing every day what you're doing. That's, that's, that's what keeps us going. And what money, uh, is it, um, uh, more viewership of 5 million people is all irrelevant. It's about just raising consciousness on issues and hoping for meaningful change and some causes are lost causes, but there are noble causes. And this is what, how we measure our happiness in this. Uh, and with that, we will end here now. There is an uh, info place where you can go get some information from us. Uh, Paul J, founder of The Real News Network. Check out therealnewsnetwork.com. Check out Annie Michon's, what's, what's, how you spell the word? Just, Annie just, 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 CH. <laughs> CH. Switzerland just is a safe place. <laughs> Uh, I didn't get that. Did you see something? <laughs> Got to get the URL right. Realnews.com. Yeah, I was just reading your banner, the realnews.com. All right. And I so got, can I check these guys no. out. They are doing some great job to pick up some info material where you can find. And thank you for joining us today and see you soon. <laughs>